following so far? Yes. Everybody understand what's going on? Thank you. To convert the distances you read on the scale because sometimes the scale is reading in kilometers and you will want to convert them in meters or what's not. You will check the scale in the map first, see if it is in the measurement you want it to be in. And you would measure the straight line distance with the rule, a ruler that you have because when you're doing the exam, you should have a ruler. And you would calculate the distance in kilometers using the following procedures. At the scale of the map is one to fifty thousand, you would divide the distance measured in the map by two. Example, one to fifty thousand, the distance would be ten centimeters. Distance in kilometers would be ten divided by two. That's how you get it in kilometers. At the scale of the map is one to twenty five, for example, and you would divide it by four. Because as uh, you can see here, you want to fifty thousand, want to twenty five thousand, half you want to fifty thousand, so you would multiply that way. And you can say the distance is twelve centimeters and the one point eight kilometers. It will be twelve divided by four is three three and so on and so on. And you want to ten thousand, you would divide the distance measured by ten. And these are these are division, these are Calculations you need to like remember how to convert centimeters into kilometers for the exam. These are the steps to measuring curved line distances. Is this is kind of similar to how you measure straight line distance, but instead of using paper, you would more use a string so you could get the curves in there when you're measuring the distance. You usually use the string to trace the curved path and mark the end of the string at the two points you want to measure between. As you can see here, people you will want to measure between point C and D. Then after that, you will do the same thing you did with when you were measuring the straight line distance and place the string on the scale and then read the distance and then convert it if necessary. Sasha? Good night. Um, sixteen point plus. Right now, we'll be discussing the sixteen point compass. If you have any questions about the previous slides, feel free to ask before we move forward. Okay. Direction. Two ways to describe the direction of a place. Using compass point. Cardinal points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. Intercardinal points of the compass, northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest, so on. Basically, you know, you have your um, four-point system, north, south, east, west. But in between those, you would have northeast, southeast. Northeast, southeast, southwest, northwest. And then you have the secondary ones, which would be north, northeast, south, southeast, west, southwest, and so on. You can also describe a uh, direction of a place using bearings. The direction of a place is expressed as an angle in degrees. Clockwise from the base direction, which would be zero degrees. Base direction could be grid north, magnetic north, or true north. The difference between the points north, grid north, 
the direction of the vertical grid lines called eastings on a map. Magnetic north, direction of the magnetic north pole. True north, direction of the geographic north. Any questions? Okay. Um, I don't really understand the grid north. Okay. And the magnetic north. Okay. So grid north is how's that? Then think of a globe, right? Where on the globe or map of a globe, you would see these um grid lines or these lines um going around the globe and then going up and down the globe, right? Grid north is where all the lines, um, vertical grid lines, which would be called eastings, that has the name of vertical grid lines on a map. Gr grid north is where they converge to get at the top of a map or on a globe, for example. So basically, anything, if you get a set grid, um, grid points, north on that grid is anything on top. That are in the that is in line with the vertical grid lines. You understand? You understand what I'm trying to say? Yes, I understand. Okay, great, awesome. All right. Forward. Next slide. Great. Next slide. Right. <laughs> Land elevation. Okay. Contours. These are lines drawn on a topographic map to, that shows where there is ground elevation and depression. Understanding contour lines on the map, this would help you basically identify lines on the map joining places within the same height, as well as the number of, on a contour line indicates the height that the line represents. As you can see in the example here, the number itself is the contour value, right? So let's say one of the numbers you see has an M on it, you know that's in meters. Therefore, all of these are in meters. So it goes, the one that's in the direct center is the highest point as the spot height, that's 54 meters. And, it, and the height goes down. So we have 54, 50, 40, 30, 20, and 10. Spot height. Points, dots, and the, cor the corresponding number besides it on the map represent hill, hills and their height. So, if you look back at the example, contour lines is higher than 30 meters, but lower than 40 meters above sea level. That's just a reference point. Basically, which it's just basically saying that it's not necessarily 54 meters tall, but more so you measure along on a map. It's not necessarily that, that important to know the specifications of it, but it's important to, to know the numbers. The difference in elevation between two consecutive contour lines is called contour interval. So that would be like the difference being um, the minus. So in this case, it would be 10 meters. The difference between the 30 meter one and the 10 meter one, 10 meters. All right, move forward. Benchmarks. These are marked points of known elevation, which are used as reference points for which the height of surrounding locations may be established. Number four, trigonometrical, sorry, I, I, I tend to have a pronunciation problems. Uh, trigonometrical stations. These are points marked using metal disc mounted on stable foundations such as concrete pillars. They are usually located on the top of mountains or hills. They may be used as benchmarks for measuring elevation. So that's just something to keep in mind moving forward. Recognizing the relief on a map. 
the shape of contour lines and the spacing between them show us the shape, height, and slope of relief features on a map. As you can see in the examples, they showcase to you what these specific contour lines um, correlate to what type of feature on a map. You see a plateau, you see a mountain, you see undulating relief, a gentle slope, a steep slope, a steep slope. These are things that are important to know. Yeah, these, Any questions before I move forward? At the bottom are very important to remember. Okay. Continuing. River features. The topographic map can also give some information on rivers, such as river source, river mouth, river course, watershed, and drainage pattern. The river source is the point where a river originates. The river mouth is the point here, the point where a river ends. The river course is the path followed by a river. The perennial course flows throughout the year. In a definite or seasonal course flows only during certain seasons. So that's basically just a specification of a river course. Perennial or indefinite or seasonal course. Always remember, perennial, constant throughout the year, indefinite or seasonal, flows only, flows only during certain seasons. They'll basically dry up and stuff like that. Watershed. This is the boundary between two drainage basins. And a drainage pattern is the pattern found, sorry, formed by the rivers in a particular drainage basin. Types of drainage patterns. We have dendritic patterns, which you may be more familiar with seeing when it comes to rivers. Um, it's what most people would think of. You have another form of dendritic patterns. Seeing that they're all labeled as dendritic patterns, but don't mind that. If you have any questions after class, I can clarify that. Moving forward. Cross-section. A cross-section of a map gives a profile representation of what a section of a country or area looks like. It cuts across or gives a side appearance of the landscape. One is able to notice where the land is flat or where areas, where areas of highlands are. Therefore, a cross-section shows the various height levels or elevations of a region. Drawing a cross-section. Now, drawing a cross-section helps the reader identify relief features, right? You know, generally like um, drainage patterns as well as contour lines and features that go along with that. Step one, draw a line Draw a line X, Y, cross the map where the cross section is to be drawn. Step two, place a strip of paper on line X, Y, moving from left to right. Mark each point on the edge of the paper where X, Y meets a contour. As you can see, each, po each point your paper touches a contour or meets a contour, you're going to mark that along the XY path. On another piece of paper, draw the horizontal and vertical axes for the cross section. Uh, there is a uh, typo error. Axis is XIS, just remember that. The horizontal axis should be the length of XY. Choose a suitable scale for the vertical so you know if you're going to if your contour lines have meters you're going to choose um a scale when you're making your your access points to plot it out that you can either convert or use meters or use something that is you know within that range 
4. Place the marked edge of the paper strip from step 2 along the horizontal axis of the cross section graph. For each mark on the paper strip, draw a vertical line up to the equivalent height and mark off with a dot. So it's basically just plotting points, right? Step 5. Join all the dots with a smooth curve to complete the cross section of x y. As you can see, that's the curved line that you would draw to complete the cross section. And the lines going up is where you would have taken your strip of paper and just mark off those points and draw a line upwards to be as accurate as possible. All right. The next topic is gradient. It's gradient. If you have any questions before we move forward, is everybody following us over? Yes, I'm following. Okay. Okay. Next topic is gradient. Gradient determine. Gradient is what determines the rise of the land over any given distance on a map. It's usually it's useful in finding out how steep or gentle a slope is, and engineers use gradients to assist them in road or railway construction. True, though roads can be constructed in steep gradient, very steep ones are mostly avoided because it would be pretty inconvenient, and railways are built on gen mostly built on gentle gradient. And how to find gradient? Gradient is expressed as a ratio and is based on a given formula. And this is a formula you need to remember. And larger the larger fraction is that the gradient or vertical rise of the land is gentle. The smaller the fraction means that there is a steeper rise in slope. And you also have to remember that definition. Gradient is calculated by the vertical interval or the vertical rise in land divided by the horizontal distance. Our gradient is also calculated by the difference in vertical height divided by the distance apart. Everyone understand that? Yes. And this is an example here where we have the horizontal distance at 60 meters and the vertical at 3 meters. To calculate the gradient for this, you would then divide the 3 divided over the 60 and treat the vertical interval which with the 3 divided by the horizontal distance which with the 60. This will give you 3 over 60 which will equal 1 over 20 and expressed as a ratio that would be 1 to 200. Understanding vertical interval and horizontal distance. Yeah. Hold up, hold up. Jerk about. That's a typo. It's supposed to be 1 to 20. Wait, 1 to 20, my bad, my bad. Okay. Uh, 3 over 60 will equal to one, 1 over 20, and as a ratio, that would be expressed as 1 to 20. Understanding vertical interval and horizontal distance. Vertical inter interval refers to the interval are spacing between the contours and horizontal distance refers to straight line distance between the given points converted into kilometers to meters converted from kilometers to meters as you remember we did earlier when we were learning how to measure straight line distances or curved distances and that's about the end of this um, thing uh, any questions Hi, good night. Is the um, do you have to express the gradient as a ratio, right? Yes, please. Okay. And the notes for this um, these slides, will we be getting it? Yeah, I will post the slides inside the um, the form geography chat. Okay, thank you. No problem. Let me go back to the rivers where the typos were 
right these rivers here this one will be the dendrit um pattern this one will be known as a trellis this one would be known as a centri petal this will be known as a rear deal and when it comes to these rivers it's always good to try to remember what the names of the pattern because these frequently come inside the multiple choice section of the geography paper dendra is always the one that is easiest easiest to remember because it kind of looks like something like a tree it's rip this like when you try to picture a river in your head this is the one that you mostly think of the sen the centripetal the centripetal pattern is the one that it looks like all the rivers is flowing to one specific location it's flowing from outwards inwards into one location the radial will be the opposite of the centripetal it's flowing from one location outwards something like a like the, the water is radiating outwards if you understand me and the trellis pattern is always the one that most forget because it's not how rivers flow often but yeah these four patterns you need to remember these for the multiple choice so is everyone clear on how to calculate gradient and how to measure contours and stuff yes that's the end of this first class and if y'all are having any problems with any specific topics at school you can let me know and i would tailor the classes towards that topic all you have to do is uh, message me on discord privately or you can message inside the geography chat on any server <laughs> So that's the end of class for today.